Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. We are talking again today with Mark Headley. Hello, Mark. Howdy. Thanks for having me. Anytime. All right. So I know people prefer the side-by-side -side view, especially when we're chatting and they get to see all of our hilarious facial expression reactions to each other. But um, sorry, everybody. This is the best format for now. Um, so we had just sort of um, uh, discussed maybe picking some subjects to talk about and uh, combining it with a Q&A. But I, uh, we got so many questions submitted for the Q&A that I think we should just make it pretty much all Q&A. Uh, the first question that people asked about, uh, which was perfect because it's one of the reasons we wanted to do this video today, is when is your audiobook coming out for Blown for Good? Uh, I just finished doing all the narration for it. It's been submitted to Amazon, Audible, and iTunes, and it should be out in the next week or so. I wrote the book in 2009, so it's almost been 10 years, and uh, I'm an older, older person now, but uh, I try to live up to the 10 years ago me and, uh, and, and bring it to life. But, uh, but yes, it, uh, it was actually, believe it or not, it was the first time I read the book. There was a whole bunch of things in there that got taken out because it was too long when I first wrote it. It was about twice as long as it ended, what ended up being printed. And uh, so it was good for me to read through it. So now I'm like, okay, and now I know which stories are in there and now I know which stories got taken out. So we'll see. For the longest time I've been doing interviews, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I talked about that in my book. And uh, I never went back and actually checked, but uh, so I'm fresh. I know exactly what's in there. That's awesome. Uh, what was the price of the regular book compared to the price of the audiobook? Are they the same? I don't know because Amazon prices it when they uh, when they released it, and it depends on how many they sell as how they what price they assign to it. So we'll see. I know when the, the book first came out, I think it was like twenty nine ninety five for the hardback, and I'm gonna say twenty five bucks for the paperback, and uh, you can get it for a cheaper now. And uh, also, my wife and I uh, sell signed copies on my website at blownforgood.com. But uh, you can go to Amazon. You can get it on Kindle. Uh, you can buy it from blownforgood.com. You can, you can, and then hopefully in the next week or so, we'll be able to get be able to get the uh, Audible. But if you have Audible, I think you can get it for free if you have Audible. You get so many books so often, you can just download. You don't have to pay for them unless you're crazy and you you download like a ton. Then I think you have to pay. A little bit more but uh, you can just buy it with a credit i'm pretty sure on uh, audible and then um i think on itunes it'll probably be between 25 and 35 bucks on uh itunes and on uh, amazon but uh yeah we'll see I i'm almost exclusively audiobook these days um i just i'm so impatient that once i got used to being able to listen to a book while doing other stuff yard work dishes, laundry, you know, I'm a domesticated man. <laughs> you know, if, I, if you know, if Aaron Tass is really clean, he's been listening to a lot of books lately. <laughs> I just can't go back to sitting still and reading a freaking book, even, even like a Kindle book on my phone, which is how I've read books for a long time. It's so much fun listening to a book in the author's voice. I just love it. If someone wants to buy a hard copy or the paperback of your book, it's better for you if they buy it through your own website than through Amazon. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, because then Amazon take when Amazon sells it, they take a cut and they take a cut for the fulfillment and then they charge for the shipping. And when you get it from me, it's almost the same price. Um, and it just we just get it and we pay for the shipping and we, we ship them out usually the same day we get the order. So. It might even be a little faster than Amazon, depending on how long it takes Amazon to get us the order and all that good stuff. But uh, but I'm easy. Whichever way, whatever people want to do, I'm there for okay, you. Okay. I'll send you you're, a book. So you're easy. But for those watching, if you want to buy the book, go to blownforgood.com instead of Amazon. It, I mean, it just makes more sense. All right. So that was the first question about your audio book. Um, there were um, several questions about the Aftermath Foundation. So I figured we could just tackle them all as one question. I haven't uh, taken an opportunity recently to to really discuss the foundation on any of my videos um, other than just very, very briefly. Um, how did the foundation come to be and, and what does the Fa Aftermath Foundation do? I think the biggest uh, thing that happened was after Leah's show, The Aftermath, was on, 
there was so many people reaching out to offer help to people that had participated on the show or just to people in general that were leaving Scientology that that's how the foundation sort of came about. Like, okay, yeah, we should do this. And I know a lot of us, I know myself in particular, since I left in 2005, I've probably gotten, I want to say 20 people jobs. Um, I flew one guy from Europe back to the States, helped him buy a car, uh, helped him get a job. Uh, other people just helped him get a job, helped him out with a loan, did all sorts of things. Um, when people first left the Sea Org or first left Scientology, try and help them get on their feet, you know, told them how to get the credit, uh, get, get a credit because you're in the Sea Org, you don't have credit. So, you know, I went into, I tried, I was starting to make some money after I first left. I tried to buy a car. They said, we can't sell you a car. I said, I have the money. They said, I know, but uh, you don't have any credit. Like you just have nothing. You don't even exist. Like how did you get to be 32 years old and not, like buy a magazine subscription, like nothing. So um, teach them, just help them out, have some kind of support network. And um, I know a lot of us who've left have done, you, I know you've done it with people, you've helped people um, that have left. And um, you'd think it'd be a really simple thing, but um, there's, and some of those people we tried to help ended up being double agents that were working for the church, trying to infiltrate our, personal lives and business lives. So, um, so it backfired a few times, a lesser percentage than, than overall. But um, so having an actual foundation set up with members and legally and, uh, you know, all these things just seemed like a, a better way to do it. And since there was so many people reaching out, we had, we had lists of hundreds and hundreds of people that were like, like people can stay with me or I'd give you some money if somebody needed some, needed to get a, make a car payment or needed to get a, a place to live. And so, uh, so yeah, I think it's, uh, it's been several months now and there's several people that have filled out applications and have asked for help. The foundation has approved those. And um, yeah, I think some of them, I'm not sure what will end up being shown, but I'm, I think even some of those people might even have participated in the filming for season three um, of Leah's show to show that these people that reached out that yes, they did get helped and they're doing better because of it, or they were able to, you know, a lot of, a lot of the people that want to leave Scientology can't because their mom and dad are in it and they live in their mom and dad's house or, the car that they drive is the dad owns the car. It's in his name, or and so it's sort of like they get given this ultimatum: like, well, if you leave Scientology, then you're not going to have a car, and if you don't have a car, then you don't have a job, and if you don't have a job, you won't be able to pay rent, or you can't stay in my house, or you know whatever the ultimatums are that these people are given if they choose to leave or speak out against the abuses in Scientology. So, having a support network or somebody to go to for some help you first get out is it's kind of a big deal for some people so that's basically what it is it's and it's um i think pretty much yeah i'm pretty sure that everyone involved in the foundation is someone that has appeared on leah's show in some form or another and um they understand what these people are going through and they've either been there or they've been on the other side of trying to help these people um it, whether it's in a, a legal capacity or advice or whatever so yeah so that's uh, i think i think that's a good example that's a good explanation great um one question that has come up here and there is about um why the foundation doesn't do more promotion about the people who who has been helped and um what i should say about that is we have made a decision to not discuss anything about those who have been helped and leave it totally up to the individuals um, to discuss it themselves. Who the church has found out about have been harassed in meaningful ways. Um, and it's almost like anything we say about it is a little bit too much. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I mean, even I know for a fact, one of the, in a total random coincidence, I actually knew a business owner who's never had anything to do with Scientology in his whole life. And somebody 
that worked for him was being harassed by them. And it also happened to be somebody that the foundation had, ha had helped. And, and it was a total coincidence. And, and, and then, yeah, I found out through an another channel that this girl had been harassed at her place of work by them. And it was about her getting help from the foundation. That was the thing they were harassing her about. It wasn't that she left Scientology. It was that she was helped by the Aftermath Foundation. So yeah, they're, uh, they're pretty crazy um, about these people having, the thing that I think drives Scientology crazy is that there is a resource to help people that are leaving Scientology. That alone is kind of putting, it's a chink in their armor because there was never anybody to help these people. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, I think you're right. I think it's just, if the person wants to talk about it, great, but otherwise we're not, we're, we'll help them all day long, but we're not gonna talk about it. We're not gonna get into the details of it. And, um, and if they wanna talk about it, then good for them, great. We don't mind, but. Yeah, and so even our list of volunteers, if somebody needs help in a particular area and it's very specific help, we will only message the people on the volunteer list who live in that immediate area. Um, there have yeah. been a couple instances I can think of where for some reason or another, we did send an email to the entire um, volunteer list. I've seen a question, well, someone asked me this question in person, but I'll just I'll answer it. None of the board members, of which there are seven, um, get any compensation in any way, shape, or form for their involvement uh, in the foundation. Uh, there's a lot of ways to help people that are leaving Scientology that don't involve money or along the lines of just he helping someone with a support network, hooking up with other former Scientologists in their area, um, maybe with some career counseling type help, resume type help, uh, like you said, um, advice regarding credit related issues and things like that. So next question, Mark, do you still talk to your sister and does she still live in Canada? Um, I have not spoken to my sister one single time since uh, January 2005, the day I left. And um, she was moved to Canada. Then she, I think she had to move out of Canada because she was working. And then she went to Mexico. And last I heard, she was working for a Scientology company in Clearwater and that she lived in Florida. Are you serious? She works for American Power and Gas. Ah, yes. Wow, so to the best of your knowledge, she currently lives here in Clearwater. She does. I think she lives at just a few blocks from you, actually. Send me a postcard or something with a picture of all your kids and shit, and I'll drop it in her mailbox. <laughs> right. She works for, uh, what's uh, Denise uh, Miscavige's uh, old husband? Sam Licardi. Sam Licardi, or Licardi. I always said yeah. Licardi. But, yeah. Um, Whatever. That dude. Wow. That dude. <laughs> she works for American Power and Gas. I, I think the funny thing is she does exactly what she did when she worked at Golden Era. She's like over personnel in, in HCO. The, like the personnel division of Scientology is called HCO. That's what she does for American Power and Gas. Apparently, that's what I've been told. But um, wow. You know, the funny thing is, is when she worked in... When she worked in Canada, the company that she worked at was a Scientology company. And a member of Anonymous was working at that company. And he was giving me like weekly updates on what she was doing at the company. And then when she went in the middle of nowhere, they were at this place, I think it was called the Hockley Highlands. It's some resort like little property in Canada in the middle of nowhere. And um, some person from there was telling me what she was up to. And, um, and we actually even heard from the police station near their property because someone had escaped from the property and my sister was the one person sent to recover them. And so we heard about that. And then when she was in Mexico, somebody was giving me the current spiel. So pretty much anywhere she goes, there's somebody who lives down the street or works with her or somewhere that says, oh, hey, I just wanted to tell you this is where your sister works. So no matter where she goes, somebody ends up telling me that works, that usually works in a cubicle next to her. <laughs> like, hey, just so you know, your sister's doing great. She's had her second kid. This is what she's up to. So whatever, Dude, it's a bummer. I even know 
of declared SPs who secretly, and I say secretly because nobody knows that they've ever been a Scientologist, yeah. who work at some of the local Scientology-owned companies who are literally declared SPs but are so secretive about letting anyone know they've ever had anything to do with Scientology that no one even knows they've ever been in Scientology. I'm talking ex-Sea Org members. I know, dude. I'm telling you. When Even when – I'll tell you this. This is a crazy story. There was a guy from Anonymous who was writing to me, and he was like a – he was in Hollywood. He was like a, in the industry, but he was like a member of Anonymous, and he was like doing – anonymous like scientology protests and stuff like that and i got an email or a text one day and he's like i'm at gold right now i'm in i'm in gold i'm at gold for property and i'm working for them and i'm working on videos like they hired him because he was in the industry to do some stuff out there at the property and he's like i'm messaging you from this place and i was like I, and of course i'm like there's no way and i'm like okay if you're there what's in the bathroom like what, go to the bathroom near there tell me what he's like hold on somebody has to take me to the bathroom and i'm like okay that's legit that, that that's real and then he's like yeah the men's bathroom is made up like tom sawyer there's a paint bucket on the toilet uh wall stall and there's white picket fences in there and i'm like okay he's in the there's no way anybody would know that the bathroom next to that building is done up like tom sawyer the men's bathroom is done up like a scene out of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. So I was like, okay, you're there. It's legit. That's but, hilarious. Um, yeah, they get, dude, there's so many people that work with them and for them that are, and, and the, the funniest thing is they're like, you know, <laughs> when you ask Tom Cruise, have you ever spotted an SP? He's like, dude, you couldn't spot an SP from a mile away, dude. They're working on your movie right now. You're shaking hands with them, congratulating them. And they were used to be at the end. They, I, this is a true story. It was a dude that I know who worked at the Ant Base, and he worked on a Tom Cruise movie, and Tom Cruise congratulated him for the awesome work he'd done, and he was a declared SP from the Ant Base. And Tom Cruise is like, thanks, dude. Everything you do is awesome. I love you. C can't wait to work on a project again with you. And then, you know, you go, really? Dude has no clue. <laughs> and because of how prevalent the knowledge of Scientology abuse is, particularly in Hollywood. I mean, I, I don't, I wonder if people truly appreciate um, the fact that the show, the Scientology in the Aftermath, if it has done anything, it has made knowledge of Scientology abuses just prolific in a way that it was not quite before then. I mean, obviously there were things like going clear and, and these things got a lot of attention. But I think the TV show has taken it to another level as far as broad-based awareness of the kind of abuses. Yeah, you were there at the Emmys, at the party, at the after party at the Emmys, when the show, when season one was given an Emmy award and people were coming up to us and saying, oh, I loved you on the show. I mean, that's crazy, right? When you're with all these Hollywood celebrities and you have the girl from Shark Tank is like, oh my God, that was the most crazy season and can't believe. And where's Mike Rinder? Can Mike Rinder get in the picture? Like, you're like, really? This is crazy. They, it was pretty cool. There was so many people that we saw that really had watched the show and were amazed that this is going on right there, right there in Hollywood, that this craziness is going on. Yeah. And so right. And so I think even the point I was uh, going for there is someone like a Tom Cruise who has to hire crew for everything he works on is inevitably going to be hiring people who know so much. And and based on Scientology's definition, he's he's hiring a crew just stacked with SPs or um or sympathizers to SPs, I guess. Yeah. We even met that one girl. We met that one girl that night after the Emmys, and she was like, oh, I was doing all this work, and da-da-da-da-da, and I went to the Celebrity Center, and she was like, oh, you cannot put your name on their list. You will get more promo than Bed Bath & Beyond said. 
if you get on that Scientology mailing list. And remember, she was going, she was telling us all kinds of crazy stories and she worked for him. <laughs> So funny. So funny. All right. So that was about the Canada stuff. All right. Here's a question from um, the last question was from Heather McCluskey. This question is from Drew Latasse. What parts of the tech did you still believe in when you left the Sea Org? When I left, so I didn't do a lot of, I did your basic training that you do, but I mainly did work when I was at the property. But, you know, they tell you if you get exposed to these upper level materials, OT3, the OT levels really, clear and OT, the OT levels. If you get exposed to those, they tell you you're gonna get pneumonia and you're gonna die, okay? Well, right after I left, I left in January, 2005. It wasn't more than a month, a few months later, that South Park episode was on that has the whole OT3 in it. And I watched that episode and that night, I laid in bed like, oh my God, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. <laughs> and I woke up the next morning and not only did I not have pneumonia, not only was I not dead, I didn't even have like a sniffle. Like I was like, hmm. Anyway, so then that was the first thing that sort of made it all like, oh my God, it's a bunch of bullshit, nothing happened. So I sat down and read all the way from clear to OT8. I read it all in one sitting on the internet. I just went, I read everything. And the same thing, that night I was like, okay, I was bracing for it. And then the next day nothing happened. I was like, okay, it's just all bullshit. That's it, that's it. Because you know, you know, if you get exposed to that, you're dead. Nothing happened. And not only did nothing happen to me, nothing happened to any of the other millions of people who watched that South Park episode. It doesn't happen to anybody who's read any of this stuff ever. So, so it didn't take, so basically it didn't take any time at all for me to go, okay, this is just a bunch of malarkey, you know, like no, there's no, there's no legitimacy to any of this stuff. L. Ron Hubbard was a fiction writer. Like he's one of the most prolific fi fiction writers of all time. So he's just a little bit more prolific because he wrote all of the stuff in Scientology, which is also all fiction. So um, it's not a big stretch to say like that he made that stuff up. People constantly ask like, don't Scientologists realize that, like you said, this guy is like the most prolific science fiction writer of all time. And then he wrote Scientology. Isn't that a red flag? But I love explaining to people that it's not that Scientologists ignore that. It's that Hubbard says the reason he was able to be such a prolific science fiction writer is that he was writing based on his memories. Yes. So, and also, and he also <laughs> says that's how he funded his research into Scientology was through his science fiction. That's what gave him the resources to be able to do all this, this research into the human condition and to figure out all this stuff. And you're like, uh, yeah, no, dude, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what happened. You just kept yeah. writing science fiction. You never stopped. <laughs> you know what's funny, Mark, is that Hubbard, you know, like you said, he says, if you're exposed to the OT3 material before you're set up for it, you will get pneumonia and die. And yet, if you read his um, his book, is it Battle in the Stars, something in the stars? What is it? What is it? Revolt in the Stars. Revolt in the Stars. It's the fucking OT3 story. It is. It, but it's, but now here's the crazy thing. There's just a few changes in that story, but that's a fiction story. He wrote that book. That's a fiction book. But it was it supposed to be, but it was supposed to be, correct me if I'm wrong, his way of subtly re-stimulating the population of Earth so that they would sort of be in a frame of mind to go find Scientology. And I'm just kind of pointing it out as kind of a, um, a logical inconsistency is like, wait a second, because you packaged the information in a book and called it fiction, that's not supposed to give people pneumonia. <laughs> but if you tell them it's OT3, then it will. He also can't seem to get the name straight either. He's like, it's Zemu or Zenu, spelled um, X-E-M-U or X-E-N-U. 
But like, you no, know, it's it's one or the other, dude. Like, it's not Aaron or A A Ron. It's Aaron. Okay, there's no no one's calling him A A Ron sometimes and Aaron other times. It's, dude, it's there was one. Name. Why can't you just pick a name and stick with it? It's just there's right. weird things like that where he just he he's. He's telling you this story that happened 75 trillion years ago, and he can remember everything in detail, excruciatingly, except for how the dude spelled his name. Like, <laughs> come on. What's up with that? And you know there's a comic. Uh, this so here, here's thing. a question. Oh, there's go ahead. A comic. There's a comic from that time period, and there's an intergalactic overlord named Xenu in a comic book. How's that possible? I remember it's, seeing I think, that. And I think it's before L. Ron Hubbard wrote about it. So you're like, dude, did you did you really steal like the OT level three from a comic book in the 20s or the 30s or something? Like, is that really where like is OT7 from a movie you saw? Like, we're, like we're, that's how Scientology is. He literally made stuff up. And he couldn't keep track of it so much so that he might have stolen it from a comic book. That's how crazy it is. That's wild. So let me ask you this. I've spoken a lot about how even though I was in Scientology for a long time and never really enjoyed auditing or wanted auditing or desired it, that I was still uh, what stuck me in was still a belief in the state of full OT and the belief that there was this whole bunch of unreleased OT levels that L. Ron Hubbard put together before he died and that those levels were like where the really magical shit happened. And that's how I explained away the fact that kind of like Jason Begay would say, I'd never met anybody who I thought was a clear. I'd never met anybody who I thought was an OT, but I explained it away by all these unreleased upper OT levels. And I've, I've talked about how, um, how much of an impact it had on me when I heard from people who I knew would know that LRH didn't leave behind a fucking thing. So I wanted yeah. to ask you, when you were at the Int base, did you believe that there was all these unreleased OT levels? Was that something you believed? No, we, we at the, being at the Int base, anything that was releasable was released. Like by the 90s, Pretty much everything was done. Like it was just a matter of going back and fixing things that were done wrong or there was something that was messed up. And basically just repackaging. And there was always this rumor that there was an OT9 and 10, but that was it. And there wasn't anything past OT9 or 10 because that's what Hubbard's supposed to do when he comes back. That's why they built this mansion. That's why they do all this stuff. So when he comes back, he can finish. He's he according to Scientology, he's off right now researching and developing the upper OT levels. That's why he had to get rid of the body because those levels could not be researched or perfected with a body. You have to be out of the body to do that. Okay. Now the other thing is that when Pat Broker left, Pat Broker was really who was with L. Ron Hubbard up until his death, him and Annie, Pat and Annie Broker. And Annie Broker has also passed away now. But when Pat Broker left, um, I'm pretty sure Dave thought that he took OT9 and 10 with him. Because he was the only one with Hubbard, and he's the only one who would know if there was an OT9 and 10. And I think Broker played it like, dude, I got OT9 and 10, and I'm not going to give it to you. And that's why I'm the boss, and I'm going to take over. And somehow Miscavige manages to oust him anyway. But then he sent, I think those are the two private investigators that were watching Pat Broker for like 25 years. Those two guys that did that uh, article with the St. Pete Times, uh, Merrick and some other guy. Dave Miscavige paid them a million bucks a year for 25 years to watch Pat Broker. and. I'm pretty sure that's because they thought Pat Broker had OT9 and 10. Like, there's no other reason to watch that dude unless he's got OT9 and 10. And guess what? He didn't have any OT9 and 10 because no one has OT9 and 10 because Hubbard was like batshit crazy right before he died. And he didn't do any work. He was just being crazy. He was, his full time job was to be a crazy old man and he wasn't doing work. 
So <laughs> he didn't get anything done. Uh, he was okay. uh, he was drugged up and didn't do work. <laughs> so while you were at the base, though, did you believe there was an OT nine and ten? We thought that it was possible that there was an OT nine and ten, but that past OT nine and ten was being developed by Hubbard out of his body somewhere in the ether. And the, and guess what? When we built that prop, when we at the property, there was a house that Hubbard had there at the property before he died, and it was called Bonnie View or Beautiful View BB. And after he died, it was still there for a long time. And then it was like, well, hold on a second. When he comes back, we need to have him a proper place. So we built this giant, multi, multi million dollar mansion for him. And he left in 1986. So theory, theoretically, in Scientology, when a Sea Org member dies, they have an issue. It's called in memoriam. And they issue this and it says, hey, we grant this person a 21 year leave of absence. Um, and we'll hold we'll hold his folders for him or some such shit. So when he comes back, his pre-clear folders will be marked, so we'll know it's him. Okay, I don't know as far as my entire Sea Org career and existence. I don't know of ever one single person coming back and saying, "Oh, I'm Billy Bob from St. Hill back in the '60s. I was like clear number 23, and I'm here to like pick up where I left off." Never heard of it happening. Okay. Well, theoretically, in 2007, is that when LRH would have come back? 1986. Help me out. Dude, I'm not, I didn't finish school, but the math on it. Yeah, 2007. Add 20, add 20 to 86. That's 2006. Add one. That's 2007. <laughs> like, what happened? It's like, it's 2018, dude. Dude taking 11 extra years as LOA and uh, didn't bring back any OT level. As far as I know, he didn't come back. So, and this is another crazy thing. They set his clothes out every day. Old fat L. Ron Hubbard. They set his old fat clothes out on his brand new bed in this giant mansion for, I guess, 32 year old L. Ron Hubbard is supposed to come back now. Um, I don't know if he's going to want to wear those clothes from 1973. I don't know. That's just me. I don't know. I mean, Mark, what makes that so ridiculous is that even in the context of Scientology, that's ridiculous. I know, but right now, today, Wednesday at 2 o'clock, there's an outfit sitting on that bed. <laughs> they're, they do, they're still doing it. They're putting the clothes on the bed for him. And they're washing those clothes. And they're changing the, the furniture every season. And they're, I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so back to this OT level point, though. So let's say yeah, you're there at the ain't base. No, levels. no, yeah. so you're at the end base. You're like, okay, we think there's an OT 9 and 10, but we don't think there's anything else because that's what he's supposed to do when he comes back. Are you aware that the rest of the Scientology world fully believes that there's like 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 just sitting in the vault waiting for release? I'll go even one step further because at the ant base, there's a ton of OTA people there at the ant base. Because in order to do these things, you have to be the level. So you can't be working on the OTA pack if you're not OT8. And I would say that every single person there at the property that's an OT8, I could run circles around in any aspect of my life, including running circles around them, like actually physically running circles around them. But there, there was no, there was no person at the end base that you would say, "Oh my God, that dude's an OTA." It would be like, it would be like, how can that person be an OT8? So sure. oh, no, for totally. me, for me personally, for me personally, I couldn't. I'm like, the OT levels have got to be a, a giant pile of shit because this girl cries half the time. She can't like do anything to save her life. And she's like pretty much useless on every post she's ever been on. And she's OT8. She's cause over life or one with God or whatever the stupid line is. They write next to OT8 on the, on the grade chart. So to me, I don't even think I gave a shit about, is there nine and 10? Do people think all these other things? Because you go at the same time, you go like, well, yeah, those people also think there's a key to life course and a life orientation course, and a this course, and a that course. And I know for a fact 
they're just a bunch of bullshit that somebody met up because they misunderstood what Elvin Hubbard had laid out to do for a course. And it was just, it was like a total screw up and it just happened to get built and made and into a course and people spent months and months and months on it for no reason whatsoever. So at a certain point, you, you're, you're totally, di by 2005, when I left, I was totally, completely 100% realizing that we're not helping anyone. There's not anything that we're doing here. It's not helping a single person do anything in the outside world. And that's why I was like, why do I even stay here? I and mean, we're not, there's no purpose for anything I'm doing. So that's a good point. Cause I think you just answered the question I've kind of been getting at is not just necessarily what you knew specifically, but, um, but this has to do with the concept um, that not everyone in the Sea Org and not everyone at international management is in on the con. Not everyone that's right. realizes that Most this people shit. Are. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And and so that's why I wanted to ask you your specific experience, because the vast majority of people, even at the international base, are not aware that it's total horse shit that LRH left behind these extra OT levels that are the answer to everything. And that if if Scientology would just meet certain expansion benchmarks, these OT levels could be released. The people who are in on the con are the ones who know that's a lie. Well, yeah, and, and there's not that many people because you even have people at the end base that have been there for years and Dave has been beating these guys up and they don't leave and they're still there. Those are the guys that are waiting for LRH to come back so they can go, ooh, Dave, you've been such a bad boy. Wait till you wait till we tell you all the things he's been doing and how he spends all his money on scuba diving equipment and underwater cameras and he's going on vacation and he's going to soccer games with Tom Cruise and you know they're waiting to tell him they're waiting to tell on Dave. And and I really do believe that they think that Al Roberts coming back. And that's the reason they haven't left. Because when they when he comes back and they tell him, oh, they're gonna be, they're gonna be the loyal officers now that save the day. Yeah. And so that's the think... saddest, that's the saddest thing to me is that not only do they buy into all the other bullshit, and Dave plays into that. Dave plays into it like we gotta get Al Rach's house built for when he comes back. We got it. And and Dave, when we're in meetings with Dave, he's talking about when we release OT9 and 10 and when we do this, as if there is an OT9 and 10. So he plays the game to sure. keep it going. And, they, and they've been saying since the 90s, they said when all orgs are St. Hill size, we're going to release OT9 and 10. So when all orgs are as big as the organization in East Grinstead, Sussex, and England, was X amount big, when all organizations are that big, we're gonna release nine and 10. Well, then he changes the goalposts and says, when all orgs, when all cities have ideal orgs, that doesn't necessarily mean when all orgs get turned into ideal orgs, it's when all major cities or capitals have ideal orgs. So that's a, another kind of like nebulous, it's not a finite thing, what could, what, so that could go on for another 50 years. Sure. He, he could easily milk that for another 50 years and never release an OT9 and 10. Personally, I think that until the day Dave Miscavige dies, he's going to milk this OT9 and 10 thing. And no one, and if there is an OT9 and 10 that gets released before then, it's just going to be something that he made up or something they have that is not codified or it's not like delineated. This is this. Then they're going to say, okay, well, let's make that be OT 9 and 10 or whatever it is. Like, even that's the same thing with uh, the superpower and the running program. The superpower and running program were never supposed to be for the public. Never. It was never in, nothing Elrich ever said was for those to be for public. Superpower and running program were designed and tested to be done on the int base for the out ethics staff that couldn't get any work done on making films and videos for Scientology. That's what the running program was developed for. That's what superpower was supposed to be. It was supposed to be for staff so that staff could deliver better. Well, there's no OD910, what do we got? Let's make the running program in superpower. 
Let's make that be for public. We'll build a whole building in Clearwater. It'll cost us, we'll raise $50 million. We'll spend 20 of it on building and we'll pocket the other 30 and then we'll uh, throw a superpower running program at these people. These people are paying thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to run around a light pole in an empty room. That's a no brainer all day long. That's like, we don't have to do anything. We just get them a running suit, put them in the room. No problem. It's crazy. I have a friend, Rafi Pendry, who has already paid to run around that fucking pole three times. Meaning, you don't run around the pole three times, you run around it hundreds of times. He's done. Thousands. Uh, so you call it the running program, they call it the cause of resurgence rundown. You have to pay $2,500 a pop. He's done it three times. I did it no once. <laughs> I, didn't pay any, I didn't pay anything. I didn't and, when you, and when you did it, it was a punishment, right? It was a punishment, and it was for staff that gave – basically, it was for people that they couldn't get to do what they wanted them to do. So it's like, we're going to make you into a moldable, controllable person. And the craziest thing about that is, is you realize once you've done that, that you can do whatever the fuck you want. And it actually, if you're like a person that's like a – uh, a square peg that's trying to stick in a round hole. When you're done with the running program, you're like, oh, I'm so square now. I'm never going to be round. You ain't ever going to fit me in that round, <clears throat> that round hole. And the other thing that this, they know this at the ant base. Everyone at the ant base, I think it was like 97%, 97% of the people who had done the running program at the ant base, blue. 97%. Like, you get so good at running, you just run the you just run the hell right out of that place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you mentioned that um, you know the fact that so many people at the Int Base do believe Hubbard is coming back are true believers. They aren't in on the con, and that's one of the ways Miscavige is able to control these people. Um, do you think Shelly Miscavige falls into that category? I don't think many people realize that Hubbard practically raised Shelly. She's not. She's a yeah. second gen member. Uh, do you think she's one of those people who believes Hubbard is coming back? And she's one of those people who, if the FBI raided the Int base today or whatever base Shelly's at, she would not leave. She she's waiting for Hubbard to come back so she can tell him what a motherfucker Miscavige has been. Well, you're right. She was like 12 when she joined the Sea Org. She really, maybe even younger. I think Janice would know, but she was a kid. She was either, if she was a 13 year old, I would be amazed. I think she was younger than a teenager when she started being a messenger for Hubbard on the Apollo ship in the 60s. She was a kid, a little kid. She knows nothing else besides that world. I cannot imagine, I don't even know how she could not believe everything that she's been told and that's why when you say hey dave says you're getting locked up and you're going to go to be up in the mountains at cst or wherever she is okay she's done she's gonna do it you can do whatever she's told she's a seer member you're supposed to do any job you're told and go anywhere you're told to do and she's been a seer member since she's 12 years old so i really do and that's the same for ray midoff mark yeager guillaume lesev Heber, all these guys, that's all they know. That's their life. They're so loyal to a fault that they'll stay there and put up with all of David Miscavige's nonsense because he's really doing what L. Ron Hubbard said to do. And right. Scientology is doing okay. I mean, they have less members, but they have way more money. So it's kind of like, eh, you know, True. even Diana Hubbard, Diana Hubbard. I mean, she was one of the people. She's LRH's only uh, child that's still with the Ant Base. And in the Sea Org, no less. And Dave Miscavige is outright evil to her. Like, he calls her to her face, the Black Widow. The black backstabbing Black Widow to her face. And I heard from somebody that talked to her about David Miscavige. And she said... David Miscavige is one of LRH's last loyal soldiers. That's what she said about David Miscavige, who, 
who doesn't have one thing nice to say about Diana? I'd never heard her. He just gives her shit and talks shit about her the entire 15 years I was there. And she has nice things to say about David Miscavige. So the mind fuck is unbelievable for these people. And 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 I tell you, it's like uh, Stockholm syndrome, man. These people have been been held hostage for 20 years, 15, 20 years. They they're totally on board with the the captors. They're ready to go. Whatever you guys want to, we'll do. We'll do. Totally, totally. I mean, I think people use prison of belief to describe um, the experience of just being a Scientologist. But when you want to talk about a prison of belief, let's just talk about people who literally believe L. Ron Hubbard is coming back. Yeah, and if they leave, not they don't think that leaving is just bad for the group. They're threatening all mankind's future eternity by leaving. They're, they're not messing it up for just them. They're messing it up for all of mankind if they betray the group. That's a whole nother level of, so even if they're miserable and they don't think they should be being treated the way they do, it's still, what about all of mankind that we're trying to save? What about all the people of the world that don't deserve to be enslaved by psychiatry and drugs and you know all these evil things that are gonna happen? Well, then I just have to suck it up for them. So it's, yes. it's that's the other thing. It's that's totally it selfless. It's totally selfless. Yeah. And so that's why somehow it is really a trick. You somehow have to say, screw these guys. And also, oh, by the way, also screw mankind. Fuck them. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you get out, you find out like, wait a minute. Like, mankind don't give a shit. Mankind don't give a shit about any of this nonsense. Right. And not only that. No one does. Like, no one does. When you get out of that little bubble, you find out, like, they're so small of a tiny little group that, like, they're really insignificant at the end of the day. they For a, such a tiny group, they cause a lot of heartache and a lot of, they break up a lot of families. But in the overall scheme of things in the world, they're still tiny. They really are. Yeah. I mean, so when, when your level of belief runs that deep, someone doesn't have to hold you hostage. You're doing yeah. it to yourself. And um, that's what I try so to tell people. For the most part, I'd say 95% of the people, maybe 90% of the people are never going to leave. They're never going to try to leave. But then you've got this 5 to 10% of the people that they're, all they're doing is thinking about leaving. And so when they try to bust out, they get caught and they get dragged back. And that kind of dampens the, 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 uh, the ambitions of those that 10% want to try to escape. They know it's going to be really hard to do it when they do it. And when you go, you got to go like in a blaze of glory. You got to get out of there. You can't just be like, I'm leaving. No, you got to like, you got there's people that have driven through the gate in their cars. Yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. how crazy they wanted to get out of there. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you mentioned that Diana Hubbard was the last one of Hubbard's children that's still in the Sea Org. She's the last yeah. one of his family members that's even in Scientology. Well, yeah, there's different schools of thought on that because some of why I mean, well, because he has other children that aren't there. They don't talk out about it, but they're not in Scientology. But they're not like going to course every week and like, you know, showing up at flag and- No, 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 hold on. Let me, I just want to make sure if I don't have this wrong or if we're, uh, let's agree on if we're disagreeing. Diana yeah. is the only member of, the only descendant of Hubbard who yeah. is still a Scientologist, no? Yes, yes, that's right. Which is insane. You'd think that would be but, such a red flag. Well, guess what? Dave Miscavige, his brother left, his dad left. It's the same kind of scenario. His niece, Jenna, it's the same kind of thing. And which you right, you're exactly right. You think you go like, well, cool, okay, hold on a second. If it's so awesome, then why aren't there like like 20 uh, more Hubbards that are floating around talking about how awesome their dad and their granddad and their great granddad? No, they all want nothing to do with that dude. And not only that. That dude's got three sets of families that want nothing to do with him. It's not just the last set. He's got multiple sets. 
they all are like, this dude's a crazy motherfucker. So yeah, it wasn't like he was crazy in the Scientology period. No, he was consistently crazy throughout all of his families. So much so that none of them are like running around talking about how they're descendants of him. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, last question, last question. Um, this is yeah. from Danny, I say it, Baloo, Danny Baloo. Okay, Mark, you often recount things with a sense of humor, but is this only in retrospect at how absurd it was, like having to sleep under a desk, for example? Like at the time, did you have a sense of deserving it and you were just doing what you could to get back into the good graces or have you always had a sense of the absurdity that goes on, but let's leave it at that. Yeah, I think, and anyone who knows me while I was at the base knows that I'm pretty much the same as I was there. Like I was a little bit flippant and I wasn't like, even when someone say, oh, this is the way we do it, I'd be like, uh, okay, but uh, you know, that's not a good way to do it, right? We're gonna do it this other way. Like, that seems like a lot of nonsense to me. Like, so there was a lot of times when we would make light of the craziness, like even silly things, like the horrible food. Every week is when you get the money for food that week. So it's not like you have like a month's worth of food, or it's not like you have a pantry that's just filled with food. The, the org makes X amount of money, and then the org says, okay, we're gonna spend $2,000 on food for this week. And FFP, financial planning, gets approved on Thursday, and people are buying food on Friday morning for crew to eat on Friday lunchtime. That's how tight it is. That's how it was at the Ant Base. I don't know about other orgs, but in the Ant Base, it was pretty crazy. So. If the FP didn't get approved on Thursday and something was going sideways, then we'd have must-go stew on Friday on um, lunch and dinner. And, and I would tell people this all the time, like, oh, it's Friday, we're going to have must-go stew. And people are like, oh, is that like an Italian dish? Or what, what is that? What's must-go stew? And be like, no, no, it's everything in the kitchen that must go. They throw that in stew. That's, that's must-go stew. And, and, like, and just because there was no money, you know? So like things like that. Like everybody at the base knew about Musco stew. And I would happily tell new people like, oh yeah, Friday Musco stew could be good. Could be the worst thing you've ever eaten in your whole life. You know, it's just like, depends. Like, you know, if we had fried That's rice funny. yesterday, it's in the Musco stew. So, you know, the funniest thing that would happen at the, at the uh, pack base in Los Angeles is that, um, uh, you know, the food is so regulated that, I mean, Unless you've, until you've seen grown men shoving each other over blueberry cobbler or chocolate chip cookies. Dude. The most valuable, realize the Sea members are supposed to be, within Scientology and in their own minds, the most valuable beings on the planet. The upper tenth of the upper tenth of the most ethical beings on the planet. And yet grown ass adults are shoving each other over cobbler. At the base. We could only have granola for breakfast because they ha they made it. It was homemade granola. We didn't get no Rice Krispies or Corn Puffs or Raisin Bran. And that was one of the biggest sources of dissension in the film crew and the video crews that we could never come to terms with was at the end base, we're supposed to have five tar star chefs. We're supposed to have all these wonderful meals. We're not really, not really seeing that, not really seeing where those stars are coming. but when we go to CC, <clears throat> CC, Celebrity Center, like, how the fuck do they get Raisin Bran for breakfast? Like, <laughs> now I'm not talking about Kellogg's Raisin Bran. It's still generic Raisin Bran, but that shit's got raisins in it, okay? And it's it's bran. It's got some sugar sprinkled on it. Like, what's the deal? International management, no Raisin Bran. Celebrity Center, Raisin Bran. We, we would go, <laughs> if we stayed at the complex, if we stayed at the complex, which is in Hollywood, we drive over to CeCe in the morning to get breakfast because they got Raisin Bran over there, okay? <laughs> now, I'm not a huge fan of Raisin Bran, but it was way better than what we were eating. So stupid things like that, you just you just go like, what? that's the thing, that's what Sea Org members are thinking about. They're not worried about clearing the planet. They're not, they're not worried about OT9 and 10. They're worried about cookies and cobbler, and goddamn raisin bran, and why can't we get some of that over here? <laughs> and, and hamburger day. The, every base has hamburger day. It's always Wednesdays. That's the day before you got to get the stats up. So they want to be like, hey, listen, 
you want to get a hamburger, you got to get your stats. So we do that on Wednesday because Scientology ends their week on Thursday at 2 p.m. So we're going to give you some hamburgers on Wednesday, give you that extra all night power. But yeah, you're right. It is it is that way, though. You look when you're in the Sea Org, you're looking for that hamburger. Like that hamburger is going to be that hamburger could be the best thing that happened to you at least that day, maybe even that week. Maybe even that whole week, that hamburger could be like, you know, it's rough today, but on Wednesday, I'm getting a hamburger, you know, and I might even be able to get cheese on that fucker. I mean, like, yeah, it's going to be good. And and even if, it, it literally, as far as, like, whether you're going to get in trouble, you're like, I don't want to be in trouble so that come hamburger day, I'm not allowed to go get some fucking hamburgers. You yeah, know? Right. It's totally, it's totally, you know what, that's actually true. At the end, they said the same thing. If you got in so much trouble, you could get to the point where you weren't allowed to eat in the dining room. Now, for me, I like fried rice. I'll eat some fried rice. I'll eat me a whole platter of fried rice. And if they were having fried rice, I'll break into the dining room and get that fried rice. If I wasn't supposed to be in there, you fight me down. You fight me. You better have guards at the door because I'm getting in there to get some of that fried rice. There's no stopping that. Oh, that's so yeah, funny. Dude. You know, sometimes when people would get put onto beans and rice as a punishment, um, you know, the the Latinos in whether it's Mexico or Spain or the South Americans, man, they'd be spicing up those beans and rice to make it as delicious as possible. And then they would get in trouble for turning their punishment into a delicious meal. <laughs> if you had if you were on beans and rice at the back at the base, no Tabasco. No, whatever that other guy with the little hat on, the, the yellow label. None of that sauce. You got beans and rice. No tortillas, no tacos, nothing. They figured it out at the end base. If you're on beans and rice, you ain't saucing it up. You're going to eat the beans and the rice plain. All right. That's awesome. All right. Well, this has been a fun chat. Um, we should uh, keep doing more of these. And, um, well, to anyone who's watching, get Mark's audiobook when it comes out. If you're going to buy his book, get it from his website. Anything else we want to say before we end off? I think we're good. I think we answered most of the uh, interview questions. Oh, there was one other person that said they want to know about the golf course. It was Aaron, Aaron Hodges Plum. I think we sh I should answer her question because she's a dedicated fan, um, and she I'm pretty sure uh, she supports everything that the foundation does. We had a party at the Ant Base. It was in the early 90s. I think it might even have been 1990. And we had beer from 18 or 20 different countries. And that was for the beer and cheese party, which was this party that it only got held a few times at the base, but it was right around Christmas time. And it was one of the few beers and cheese parties that we had beer and cheese, and there was also a party. So it was a good beer and cheese party. And I went to, I want to say I went to at least 15 countries that night by drinking their beers. And when I got to Australia and I hit that Foster's kegger, I was down for the count. And something happened, and I don't remember what it was, but I had to go get something. And I had to drive down to the golf course to get it. It was either at the clubhouse or, I don't remember where it was, but I had to drive down the golf course to get this thing and come back to the property. And when I came back, it was so dark, that I didn't want to drive on the road. And I was a little like, I felt like I was in a, like a, a video game and I was driving on this motorcycle and I didn't want to drive on the road because it was dangerous. And um, so I was driving on the golf course on a motorcycle after about 15 beers. I do not recommend this whatsoever. But I somehow, I hit a sand trap when I was on the motorcycle and I was probably going about 40 miles an hour. And hit the sand trap, my whole body slid and I smashed my crotch on the motorcycle. And I was so, I smashed my ball so bad that I couldn't walk right for like two days after that. <laughs> anyway, but that was one of the few times I was ever on the golf course at the end base was that time. <laughs> anyway, and it was not a good experience. So I never went back. I said, I thought, I've already been on the golf course. Ain't not fun. I ain't going to do it again. And I got back to the property. I was okay. The bike was okay. I had some bruises on my inner file region. And uh, my boys were a little bit damaged. But, uh, but 
but I was fine. And whatever I went to go get, I came back with it and I saved the day or whatever. I think it was a cable or some silly thing. But um, so, yes, Aaron, that was the time I was on the golf course. And uh, I won't be playing on it anytime soon. Did you tear up the golf course with the motorcycle? Oh, I never went back to check. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to investigate the situation and lead myself into any other sorts of trouble. As far as I knew, I went and got a cable and I came back and they don't know anything about the golf course, the motorcycle or nothing. And, um, but uh, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't go and check any of that out. I'm pretty sure there was a big debt in one of those sand, sand traps, at least a debt. <laughs> a debt in the shape of Mark's face. Yes. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, we'll do it again sometime, and uh, talk to you guys soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me, man.